your stream has ended, you're no longer live. Why is that? Okay, we're gonna do this again. Maybe it's, we are live. Yeah, we are live and I think it's getting recorded also, so. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the session uh, on reshoring to rebuild America, a very important topic. I'd like to give a short introduction um, of, uh, to frame uh, what reshoring might involve. And then we have three wonderful experts in various aspects of what it would take to actually implement a reshoring policy in the United States. The search for new markets and greater profits, along with increasing costs to, in, to comply with environmental regulations, pushed many firms in decades past to assemble products in low wage, low regulation economies with growing markets. Just in time inventory became the new management goal. It, as economists such as David O'Tour have shown, there was a price to pay in manufacturing towns around the United States. Then the pandemic and very high logistics costs, costs reinforced the value of just in case redundant supply chains. Is reshoring businesses across the US feasible? Bringing, um, bringing manufacturing closer to home? How does the recent conflict in the Ukraine change the calculus? So I'm Lyric Hughes Hale. Um, I'm your uh, uh, your moderator today. I'm talking to you actually from Ukrainian Village in Chicago, and uh, I'd like to first introduce Lalit Dingra, who is founder and CEO of Ensignus Digital. I'm going to ask Lalit if he can comment on reshoring. What is it going to take? Is it harder than we think to actually begin? Uh, to uh, rebuild the manufacturing sector in the United States. Lily, welcome. Uh, good morning and thanks. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think this whole idea of uh, reshoring or this topic of reshoring has been there for not recently, but has been there for the last few years. Uh, there has been some steps taken by the U.S. government and some steps taken by the companies to get back manufacturing to the United States. Um, but unfortunately, what has happened is that the factors which actually created this whole issue um, are outsourcing of manufacturing um, to the to the low cost countries. Um, the factors still remain. Uh, so the labor cost is still the issue. Um, taxation is still the issue. And if you look at, look at the, um, the issue of supply chain, which actually got exposed uh, in the pandemic, has accelerated uh, the talks on reshoring. I don't think that it has accelerated the reshoring itself because um, it, it's, it's a complex thing. So the, the companies have taken 20 to 25 years in building the manufacturing units in the other countries like China or Taiwan or other um, Asian countries. And it is very difficult to just wind up and bring back the manufacturing in a shorter duration of time. It's going to take, uh, it's going to be a long process. And the other thing is that the labor, the shortage of labor in the United States the um, the cost of labor. So if you, if you just compare the manufacturing average cost of labor in China is around five five dollars some cents um, per hour, whereas in the United States the same manufacturing is going to be somewhere between twenty and twenty two dollars. So that factor still remains. In the recent time, because of the um, supply chain the uh, issues, the cost of supply chain has gone up. So it's it's balancing out the labor cost. But once the supply chain is going to go back to where it was in the next two, three years, we're going to see the same issues. Uh, we're going to see the labor cost, the cost of um, building a product is going to be, this, be, uh, be the factor. So I believe that it's a complex process. Unless and until the government puts a lot of incentives for the companies uh, it's going to be a long haul for getting reshoring back. So it's it's still it's going to be some reshoring back to America, but it will be a hybrid model. I mean, they will still have some uh, manufacturing there, 
there'll be some initiatives by the companies um, where you have high tech manufacturing um, initiatives by some of the companies like Intel has just done uh, announced a uh, semiconductor uh, initiatives in Ohio. So there will be a lot of things like that which will happen, but ultimately it will be hybrid model. It will not be that everything got reshored back to America. What is the role that automation is playing? I'm hearing that there is a lot of investment because of the scarcity of labor right now. Yeah, that companies and uh, companies have very healthy balance sheets, many of them, that they're putting that money into automation. How, do, how does that factor into this hybrid model you're, you're talking yeah, about? That's a very, very big factor. I mean, if you look at the all new uh, manufacturing units, they are all, most of them are high automation um, in that. So it's going to be, it's going to take care of some part of the labor um, shortages, um, but still we need a lot of high-tech labor. Um, the cost of that is going to be higher um, than, than the normal labor costs. So those, those, those kinds of industry will have a better chance of reshoring than the industries which have low automation in them. So... Okay, so uh, can you give examples? What are the high automation and low automation industries? I think I'd be so, interested. So, in so let's say if you like, if you take a mm. if you take a rubber um, factory, you, you, you know that that is a low low automation. If you take semiconductor or uh, the batteries uh, and batteries, that's a high automation. You take, for example, cars uh, today. They are having going moving towards high automation, hmm. so those industries are going to be um, better suited to, uh, you know, for for the higher automation. And also, it seems some industries you mentioned, semiconductors, hmm. um, face greater geopolitical risk. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. So now we've got the plants being built in Arizona, as you said, outside Columbus, Ohio, yep. for semiconductors. Mm -hmm. So that we're not dependent, as dependent on um, on Taiwan Taiwanese located um, yeah, it's, it's, manufacturing. Yeah, it's a China and Taiwan, which is the most I think um, the big ones in semiconductors. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the U.S. has U.S. was doing around thirty seven percent of the semiconductor in the U.S. Um, I think now they're somewhere between fifteen and eighteen percent. So they have to get back to at least 37% or 40% of the whole use of semiconductors in the U.S., manufactured in the U.S. So I think that's, um, that's a goal. And I think the government understands it. And it's a, it's a risk of uh, mm -hmm. you know, not, not getting those things done in the U.S. Right. So um, it's not just cost considerations labor considerations, there are also in this world geopolitical considerations that could be driving reshoring, is what yeah. you're saying. Okay. Yeah, so the other, other is the this high capacity batteries. So if you look mm -hmm. at it, the way we are we are looking at um, in the United States, there's a, there's a push for um, you know, the electric cars, there's a push for you know, even the making the high speed buses uh, mm -hmm. using the batteries. Now, if you're going to have that much of utilization of batteries in the country, you can't be relying on that part coming from somewhere else. So you you have to create high capacity um, batteries that are built in the U.S. So you have to invest and you have to get companies manufacturing those in the U.S. So. Yeah, I hear they're very heavy. And also there's going to be a disposal issue potentially for those too. That's another new business, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, so I think it, there is a, there's a potential. Um, but as I said, because the last so many years, the manufacturing has shifted. So the jobs are coming back in manufacturing, but they're not in that ratio that it gets back to where it was 20 years, 25 years back. So it's going to be a different model. Um, it is not going to be the same model which was there uh, you know, in the 80s, it's going to be a, as I said, the hybrid model, but you have to choose where do you want to invest? Is it going to be semiconductors? It's going to be in uh, high capacity batteries, or we're looking at pharmaceuticals, some, some important uh, stuff in that. Um, 
otherwise um i'm my worry is that once the supply chain gets back to where it was right. um things may not get slowed down so the government um the government comes and says you know there's a lot of talks about um investments and with all the bills getting passed in the um in the senate or in the government now this has to get into actions if they don't get into actions we are going to be in the same old stage that's the worry well right we're not a centrally planned economy so the government can make the conditions favorable um and i think uh uh Jarvis you're going to talk about that and taxation and so forth but they can't really force private industry to do anything they have to make that yes. decision on their own yes mm-hmm. yes yes definitely you know uh you know touching on uh Lali's point uh you know of uh you know the geopolitical risks you know um just you know uh, now in the cli- in the in the current climate of the Ukrainian you know invasion um you know we've seen uh some uh currencies you know um just you know from the eastern european countries you know falling by more than 50% say um so if you're an american multinational operating in a region uh that means you know you have lost uh, you know 50% you know of your, of the currency um just on uh, just on a face value um so it it does um it does give you know uh you know uh the executives you know uh within uh the multinational companies you know a thing uh of you know bringing back funds uh and even jobs back to the united states um so um um uh, uh so um so from uh from the taxation point of view i would like to point out that you know the previous uh trump administration you know already lower uh the corporation tax uh from mm-hmm. 35% um you know uh, back in 2017 uh to now 21% you know which uh, which has attracted um you know uh, uh you know US multinationals as well as you know foreign companies you know creating jobs and uh, and bringing funds back to the United States um so um uh, so the corporation um tax is a really big chunk of uh, tax revenue uh you know for the US government uh accounting for the third largest source of uh federal revenue uh but still uh you know uh the US uh taxation policy is still kind of um you know burdensome in comparison you know to uh to low tax regimes you know uh, such as Ireland uh the UK uh, and some of the islands in the Caribbean uh you know including the BVI and the Cayman Islands Um so I would like to make a comparison uh you know uh between Ireland and the US um um concerning uh you know uh the tax rates um so um so um so so like like I mentioned uh the uh the, the federal uh, you know uh corporation tax rate in the United States is currently at 21% um uh, so um so by contrast um you know Ireland's uh corporation tax rate is currently uh at uh 12.5% you know for for most trading companies um it's much more even lower if you um so if your company you know holds patents and copyrights uh um to, uh, uh, uh within Ireland um i think i think that is just um uh, just 6.25% um so if your companies you know are uh, holding uh uh patents and copyright um um uh, 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 uh for for your group of companies um so um uh yes so um so as i That's as right. i say you yeah as i say you can see the difference you know um you know between uh uh you can see the difference in in the taxation regimes between the two countries um so um so just moving on to the um to the to the countries in caribbean um typically uh uh the bvi the british virgin islands um and the cayman islands they don't they don't levy any sort of uh corporation tax income tax uh you know for for multinationals you know uh headquartering uh in their territories you know that is a really big plus you know for uh for 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 american multinationals um to to choose their headquarters you know uh you know uh, uh uh globally so 
So Jarvis, but by the way, I should introduce you um, to your managing director of Shinda Corporation. And you're talking to us from uh, London. Lalit's yeah, been talking here. to us from, um, and we're going to go back to you a little bit later. Lalit's been talking right. to us from, from um, Georgia. And okay. so we're going to, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask you to think about uh, in the current environment, political environment in the United States, corporations are, um, are a really target political targets as well. Yes. So is, is there any movement? So to decrease corporate taxes, I highly doubt it. And so does that make us less competitive um, overall, as you say, talking about Ireland? Yes. So um, our next panelist is Angelo Alessio, who's with Dow, am I saying that right? Architect, Build Cities, and he is a builder of organizations. And how do you how how do we build this if we want to do this, Angelo? Uh, yeah, well, again, thank you for the for the very uh, generous introduction. I'm uh, I, you know, build. Build Republic is more so the just name of it, and I am its you know humble servant as a as an entrepreneur <laughs> uh, trying to get it off the ground. So I wouldn't say I'm you know building all these all these orgs. Uh, just a little background of myself. So I was uh, I was uh, a veteran turned uh, fintech entrepreneur uh, over the last so the last four years. I've been working in the fintech space and. That's uh, led me now to work on this project called Build Republic, which is a DAO is essentially a decentralized autonomous organization. So it is a a um, a org that is uh, coordinated globally and uh, it uses cryptocurrencies as it's basically like economic and administrative rails for for building these things. And our whole our whole concept uh, right now is to do community first, real estate second approach to co-working. So essentially, you know, the typical WeWork model is real estate first, community second, community is kind of an afterthought. So you have high retention, high turnover, and not a lot of strong businesses, you know, forming out of there organically. So our whole approach is build uh, digitally first, um, and then you can build these communities and cohorts around the world and in, in pockets around the world. Um, uh, and then kind of follow up where the real estate becomes an extension of the community itself. So my co-founder, actually, who's going to be on another panel um, later this F, this evening, I believe, um, he's been doing the, this thesis in rural towns across America for the last decade and proven it out, where literally starting with meetups, starting with, um, you know, two people became five people, five people became 10, 20 um, spots like Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Brooksville, Florida, um, uh, Casanova, New York, Victoria, Texas, very much these longer tail of cities. And, you know, one of the biggest things I think that doesn't get talked about enough is, and I've worked in a lot of these ecosystems as well, where there's, you know, they're kind of a shadow of their former self, like Buffalo, for instance, used to be the third biggest town in America. Uh, and, um, you know, it's definitely you know, there's still the remnants of all the outsourcing that's happened there. Um, and what doesn't, uh, you know, what what we've kind of built there is, and what we've noticed really, is that when you have an exodus of such a large, you know, yeah, exporting your economy, basically, um, you, it's not as simple as just coming in and being like, okay, let's kind of figure out how to do these public you know, incentive programs where it's like, you know, state funded entrepreneurship, there's, there's actually a kind of, you know, a very subjective uh, process that's like actually just kind of rebuilding like the morale of the community, right? Like there's a lot that mm -hmm. respect to leadership in that local community, uh, rallying people towards either a new direction for the economy locally um, towards a, maybe it can still draw on from their historical sector, but still kind of pivoting into something ideally that's maybe a little bit more uh, forward thinking or, or like a progressive technology that you can use. Um, so, you know, I'll give you an example, like in Brooksville, Florida, you know, this is, this is a town that, you know, has not had a lot of, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, any any major stories coming out of there recently. 
Um, and so what they've done is they do a whole year long, do a whole year long kind of like consulting with all the, with all the community leaders in Brooksville, the, the, um, you know, the, the public officials and essentially figuring out like, what is that, what is that story? What can we rally people behind a certain kind of trajectory, um, for an industry there that we can bring in, you know, new innovation. So it happens to be in Brooksville, they came up with future of aging. Um, and so naturally, you know, Florida is a big retirement, uh, mm-hmm. retirement state. Um, and so they were able to, we were able to secure sponsorships with AARP and have this ecosystem where everybody there is kind of, um, you know, excited about this new direction and getting that shift and kind of orientation to this industry where they know they can kind of, you know, build out some of these new, um, maybe new startups basically. So whether that be innovations in, um, in, um, you know, senior care, senior care, uh, uh, you know, senior care technologies or, um, Oh, I'm echoing now. Oh gosh. Hold on. Sorry. I'm echoing to myself. I don't know. Oh, that's distracting. Isn't it? When that happens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's gone. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the theme. And the other thing too is, you know, I think there is when we're looking at specific industries, you know, tech itself, technology itself is a very high leverage, um, you know, it's a very high leverage attribute of an economy that allows a lot more, um, you know, a creative value to companies for, for less labor. And it, and it, and it, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily scale for, um, for actually number of jobs as much as something that you would say, like in, you know, pre-automation manufacturing era or, um, or, you know, construction, which is another huge opportunity in, in the U S I mean, we all know about housing crunch and, and really the opportunity there to, to figure out like, Hey, let's, let's, let's get construction, you know, uh, on board again, there's actually startups now that, um, are doing 3d printed houses, prefabbed houses from manufacturing facilities and then ship to their, you know, general destination. Um, and that's the kind of innovation I think that, that, you know, is needed kind of, uh, really again. And a lot of these times, these are, these are, these should be in places where it's not the typical Silicon Valley or Silicon, you know, or Silicon Alley being New York. Um, this should be in every town across America. Right. Um, and you, we've seen that also a little bit with respect to, you know, COVID, um, COVID did, you know, disperse the population kind of through uh, a lot of these different towns, smaller towns, Coeur d'Alene being one of them. I went there recently and half the people I talked to were, were coming in from San Francisco, um, uh, LA, you know, bringing their, bringing their talent and expertise to that local economy. It was the same just north of there in Bozeman, Montana. Um, and, um, you know, and that's happening in, in all cities around the, uh, around the country. So that, that I think is a, is a positive, uh, you know, a positive externality, if you will, of, uh, you know, all things considered with, with, with COVID otherwise, but, um, um, yeah, I know I kind of, so okay, the pandemic tangents. Yeah. Okay. So the, so what you're saying is the pandemic accelerated this dispersion of talent, um, away maybe from urban centers to a different, a lifestyle choice. And Correct. Uh, that's been, an external externality that you, no, none of us expected probably. And uh, I guess the question is, will people stay there or will they eventually decide to return to urban centers? Yes. But also that you're prescribing that these urban h- hubs um, find their own particular ni- niche and become an innovation hub themselves. And that that's something Correct. for each community to decide to do um, yep. as well. So my question give, for you, though, oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Give some. I I love examples in real okay, life. Okay, I'll give you some story. anecdotes. So I'll give you I'll give you an anecdote of like why this you know why this will pan out, and then I'll give you another anecdote of the specific related like hard manufacturing why it's so difficult here and why that's another area that we can really focus on. So 
Mm-hmm. I talked to a, an entrepreneur here. He was in an accelerator in New York. And, um, but his business was in, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, on a pork farm in, in, I think it was either North or South Carolina. One of the two, forgive me for not remembering, but Angela, he, where are you by the way too? I I'm in, I'm in Jersey. Where are you sitting I'm in right New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey. Jersey yeah, City. I'm in Jersey okay. City, right across okay, the way. So you're so, on the East coast too. Okay. Yeah. So he built a, um, so he built apparently in the in the pork industry there is an issue where one out of ten piglets uh, is a fatality because the mother pig like basically falls over and and kind of you know crushes it and so obviously that's you know <laughs> terrible but also a huge you know a huge bottom line you know billions of dollars bottom line for the business as well so he built a very simple device um, where. Um, uh, it's just basically like an uh, alert system or like an alarm system that like if there's a certain level of decibel level of the squeal of the piglet, then it like alerts the farmer right away and they can go kind of address the situation. Very simple, hmm. VC backable business. But the entrepreneur was working in this accelerator in New York. And I'm just like, there's no poultry, you know, there's no pork farms here in New York City. Like this, this, this shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that you need to come here to figure out to get financing for your problem that is very local to where you are at. And there's so many problems in a lot of industries that aren't seen in, uh, that you don't see in, you know, financial heart of Manhattan or the, um, you know, the tech focus area of Silicon Valley, like tech is a tool that you can kind of take from Silicon Valley and what they build there. And, but then applying it to problems such as the one that this entrepreneur is facing, those are so many local problems around, around the country, often in these very small towns uh, that has yet to be applied at all. Um, and again, this is a simple device and he shouldn't need to come to New York to get to, to, to get the support he needs to build, to keep building the business there. He should be getting that talent support, financing, capital advice where he is at. And so I think that's the biggest thing we, we can really do is meet ideas where they're at. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stay off the anecdote for the, for the hardware manufacturing, but, um, uh, bottom line is extremely hard to do to be able to do, you know, prototype, uh, hardware manufacturer, you know, hardware, hardware startups really, uh, in the U S you can get a prototype done, but all of the mass manufacturing format is done overseas. And I think that's, mm-hmm. um, you know, it should be, it should be, um, we have a, we have a hardware collective entrepreneur in our ecosystem. And yeah, he's saying like, he's never seen he's never seen the mass scale manufacturing beyond the prototype done in the u.s anymore in a financially sustainable way um so anyways yeah i can go on and on that's interesting but yeah. i don't wanna, yeah well i i i i wanted to ask lali to jump in here because is this a matter of leadership is what you're saying and where does this leadership come from Lali, I know you've written a book on this subject recently. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me. So I, I just wrote a book on uh, leadership. It's it's called Driven. Uh, so the idea came that, okay, what I have learned in my last 20, 25 years and the stories from my childhood that how I can put that into my leadership style. So that's the, that's the book about. Um, but what I'm seeing is that what, what we just l- listening is that there's a no lack of innovation in the country. So there's a lot of innovations, the ideas and making ideas to reality is, is important and that is happening. Um, but where, um, where we are lacking is like the mass production. Where do we get labor to do the mass production? Where do we get the cost benefit analysis if we do it, uh, getting it done in the US or getting it done outside? There's a huge differential. And unless and until we are going to fix those issues, we are not going to see mass production manufacturing back in the U.S. That's the point which I was trying to make in in my thought. And then the leadership from um, the government or the leadership at the top level is how pushy they are, how willing they are to make changes and how willing the government is to put investments so that we can bring back the jobs to the United States. That's important. So one is the hardware, and then we also saw in the software industry. So both the industry, uh, the the normal, typical manufacturing industry, 
in the high tech industry as well as in the software industry we see that the jobs are outsourced so we know there is a global economy we have to make sure that how we can track the um, where the resources are or where the labor is how do we use that labor and try to get optimized um, product cost down so as i said we want the jobs back in the united states we want the manufacturing done here because of the risks because of the um, the supply chain issues which we see but how to do that is 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 a complex process is that we where, need a national policy really there has to be national there has to be mm-hmm. cohesive or integration between the um, the public and the private uh, sectors and saying okay how do we how do we do that where do we where the investment are going to go in for how do you so the biggest challenge we're seeing is this labor shortage or getting the right labor labor for it so today if you look at it your uh, unemployment is 3.9% or 4% right uh-huh. which is not an ideal situation for um, getting those labor to do your jobs right you don't you don't get people so that's a that's a big big challenge so you you may have supply chain cost going up you have the labor cost going up in the united states you have labor shortage across the globe how do you tackle this um, and that's where the incentives have to be built by the government for the private sectors to do that right because if labor is about incentives as well if um people aren't being paid enough to do those jobs is that um a result Jarvis of of this tax policy that you're talking about which is not really advantageous even yes. though it's better than some places could you talk about that a little and how you know if if you were in charge of of tax policy for the US to encourage reshoring how would that tax policy differ how, what would that look like I think I think I think I think uh thank you for you know for being uh Thank you for bringing over the question. I think I think that is really interesting. Uh, uh, you know, if I were uh, you know uh, the tax policy maker, I think I think one of uh, you know uh, one of the biggest uh, you know sources uh, of spending for uh, you know for, for for all the taxes you know uh, the government has collected um, is to give people a sense of security. Um, say, uh, for example, uh, you know the so-called the so called the, the social uh, security net um so if you know i'm um, so i'm um, so i'm um, so if the government as well as private sectors you know um can build uh, a really comprehensive uh, so social network um policy uh, which addresses the issue of healthcare the issue of uh, of retirement the issue um of uh uh of uh of um being taken care of uh you know uh in uh by someone uh, after retirement you know uh you know um i think things can be achievable um um from you know from my from my understanding um 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 the us doesn't have the universal uh you know uh healthcare system you know um so the employers you know uh in the states um need to uh to 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 purchase uh private medical insurances you know for uh for the employees um so um so um so so that was a, um that was slightly different um uh to here in the UK um so the uh the, so, the, so the United Kingdom uh you know practices um the universal um healthcare policy um so that has started since uh uh um the early 70s um um so um it's so called the NHS uh um uh, uh standing for uh national health services so the government um you know provide all all the healthcare services you know to all uh residents and uk citizens you know resident uh, in the country um so so each individual doesn't have to be insured uh you know uh, by uh, so, by an insurance company um so i so think that I takes think, the burden off the exactly. employer exactly. is what you're so, saying. It's yeah, a so, yeah, it's, exactly. it's an aspect so, of taxation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So so let you know let us is um let us ease off um some uh some of the burdens you know uh the ordinary citizens you know are enduring. 
Another issue is mobility. In spite of the acceleration by the pandemic of people moving, the uh, mobility in the United States is, has declined drastically over, and I'm, you're, you're shaking your head, Lolly. Why is that? Have you noticed that? And what are the root causes of that? Because that, that means it's, it's harder for people to go where the jobs are, potentially. Yeah, I, I, I can give you an example of my own daughter. <laughs> you know, she, okay. <laughs> she, she, um, she got the, she was doing a job and suddenly she decided that she doesn't want to do a job, which is what most of the millennial people are talking about that. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'll take a break. And then when she's getting chances to go outside of uh, Atlanta, for example, she lives in Atlanta and she's settled here and, now she says, "Why should I go? Why should I go to, uh, you know, Phoenix or or California or other, other places? Because it, it's the, the cost effectiveness is I'm losing that. I'm I'm enjoying my life wherever I am. Can I get a job where I'm able to do it from here? Hmm. And the last two years have shown us that we can deliver." most of the jobs uh, remotely that's that has been the factor and you say i i can go to a place where my cost of living is low and my life is better then why should i go to the to new york city or to san francisco to do a job right. which i can do from here and if i can't do it i'll take a break in between exactly. so that's the that's the biggest reason people have realized that they can deliver productive productivity from wherever they are. And also tax policies differ quite a bit from state to state in the United States. Exactly. So uh, oh, that, Florida that has, a, for example, has no income tax, uh, state income tax, Texas as well versus California, a very high taxation state. It seems that that is causing regional differences in, right. in uh, development too. What about infrastructure? We're talking about now kind of social issues and taxation and government policy. But um, have any of you seen, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Angelo, as these rural hubs are uh, trying to reinvigorate um, um, their manufacturing, is the very poor state of infrastructure in the United States, the transportation system, energy grids, water, have, has you come up against that as also a limiting factor in reshoring? Um, so I have not personally, I'm sure there's probably anecdotes from, from my co-founder because he's, he's, he's the one who's really been boots on the ground at some of these 200 cities around the, around the country over the last decade. Um, so I do know it exists. Um, from an infrastructure, I mean, a lot of a lot of the kind of entrepreneurs in our, in our ecosystem are definitely like more uh, slanted towards towards just technologies like digital digital uh, tech. So there's not too much in the way of infrastructure issues there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'll take that back a little bit. I mean, for tech specifically, there is. Um, there is there's definitely connectivity issues in rural areas that um, um, you know can be difficult, um, but probably more so we you know we have we do have um, uh, a global kind of contributor base to our to our builder public and you know there's definitely areas that are facing it a lot worse than uh, than um, than we are and and really um, uh, yeah really having a, a hard time just you know there's there's one city in particular, I'm not going to name it, but like, you know, they're, they got on average four hours of steady electricity per day. And most of their like residential power is subsidized by, by just generators and actually mm -hmm. being more to pay fuel for the generator over the course of a month than uh, like, you know, your standard utility bill here. So nothing on that scale, nothing that can't be kind of surmounted. I would say, um, I would say, you know, given that our, our, you know, our, it is, we are kind of founded in this kind of uh, crypto and, and web three space, there is, uh, I would say probably more regulatory hurdles than um, that I think are really, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you mm -hmm. want to, if we're calling that infrastructure, then that's definitely, 
something that um, is is kind of limiting the West's, you know, America's opportunity to really participate um, and and really lean into this new opportunity, which I think is 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 not going away anytime soon, um, and will only kind of um, you know uh, get bigger over time because it is. I always, I'm under the thesis, if there's a more efficient way of doing things, it'll always kind of surface to the top and just be the prevalent, um, uh, prevalent technology. And, and, you know, with respect to, um, uh, you know, blockchain technologies, that's definitely, it's definitely the case. And, and states and like so we Montana, have to, we have for to, example, are yeah, really yeah, yeah. at the forefront of that uh, yeah, the whole, regulatory. The whole, mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole MST time zone actually is very, uh Colorado, Wyoming, uh Idaho, Montana are very and you know include Texas in there too are embracing this technology um and uh you know I was just at a conference 2 weeks ago and uh Governor Polis of Colorado is extremely extremely forward thinking with respect to you know he wants to make Colorado the first digital state um in a way uh and so you know that whole yeah, that whole time zone for 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 whatever reason is is fully embraced us and and moving forward with it. Um, but that that needs to happen at the federal level too, and I think it's it, it's really imperative to be able to um, for us to be able to embrace that sector and and embrace the innovation that that comes with it in a in a in a you know in a smart a smart way. But but um, you know there's always going to be kind of that transitionary period where it's 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 a little bit uh uh a little bit um what's the word um volatile i guess right and it's hard it's something and especially fintech it's kind of hard to understand it's about most of our, our our leadership in congress is like i don't know what the average age is but maybe over 70 yeah. or, you yeah. know and it's it's hard for hard for them to i think to really grasp what the opportunity is so what I'm hearing from everybody is that, yes, there are real reasons to reshore in the United States. There really, there's an imperative to do it. It's, um, for, but we're not really ready for prime time. The regulatory environment, the infrastructure, the labor issues, um, taxation incentives, um, the um, social safety net. Um, that you talked about, Jarvis, too, that allows employers and, and, and employees to be more nimble, just yeah. doesn't exist. And we don't have a national policy, even though we talk about it. There is no national leadership. There's no central office of reshoring, uh, a director yeah. of reshoring that we have. So it seems to me that um, it's very unlikely to succeed. Um, uh, because we don't have the necessary, uh, it's going to be individual entrepreneurs. It's going to be the private sector um, that is <clears throat> really pushing against the public sector to make this happen. So if you'd all like to comment on that, we've got a minute apiece for you to to respond and wrap up. Thank you. So Lalit, I'll go back to you first. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, but uh, I think the issue is going to happen. But the model is going to be hybrid. It is not going to be pretty quick. Short term, it's not going to happen. On the long run, I think most of the private companies and most of the companies will understand the risk, the issues concerning which was exposed by the COVID. They will try to do it in the U.S. And I think government has also woken up and there's a lot of initiatives which are happening. So as you said, there is no direct, there is no centralized um, you know, place where people say, okay, now I'm the director of reshoring for the country and that that will happen. So I think we need that kind of initiatives. So the push will happen. I think we'll get back six to eight percent to 10 percent, but not 100 so. percent. Okay. All right. And Jarvis, what are your comments? Um, all right. Thank and you, Angela, Lee. I'll let you wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in summary, um, so, um, so, uh, uh, so as long as uh, you know the issue of, of the regulatory, uh, the, te- the te- uh, taxation uh, uh, issues, you know, have not been uh, resolved. I think it's very unlikely, uh, like you mentioned, that you know uh, uh, the uh, yeah. So 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 the U.S. Uh, reassuring uh, project is going to succeed. Um, so it's very unlikely at this stage. But uh, but bringing. 
uh, but bringing forward, um, so the government should um, should set up some kind of you know preparation uh, work, uh, you know, uh, to kick start the process. I think this is really important. Okay, wonderful. And Angela, what would you like to see? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think just kind of some of the same points just mentioning earlier. I mean, if I had to kind of condense it into one way, uh, you know, the redistribution or at least more open exposure to some of the high performing industries that can be blanketed across the U.S. So, um, you know, opening up the lines of communication between, you know, um, some of the larger tech companies with Again, um, more, uh, you know, just uh, tier two cities, basically. Um, and I think, um, again, you're seeing that now with kind of the, the um, you know, the, um, uh, the population dispersal from, from these larger cities into some of these smaller ones, which will definitely help as well. Um, and so I think, again, to the point you made earlier also, remains to be seen whether there will be a, kind of uh, shift back to urbanization. So if we can, you know, build out the infrastructure, build out the, you know, the lines of communication with this new kind of phenomenon early on with these towns, then I think that stands to benefit so that people actually stay uh, where they move to and, and are able to be vested in their local communities. Wonderful. So it's about community building, too. Thank you so much, yeah. um, gentlemen, for joining me today. I think this is a really great discussion and we made some headway. I hope um, some of these policymakers are listening to you. <laughs> Thank, okay. you. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. onwards and upwards to enjoying the rest of this, the sessions today. Bye-bye. Onwards and upwards. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.